Thank you. I love my PNG community. I did not work in the US, but thanks, Ali. <laughs> <laughs> A whole continent just got covered. Um, in January uh, 2006, I moved to Japan after living in Switzerland for three years. That year, I discovered something that changed how I approach my life, my work. And today, I'm hoping by sharing it that it can change yours too. So there I was in Japan, a working mom with just two kids, just back from maternity leave in a new assignment in PNG in a new country. And everybody was telling me that everybody around me, that working in Japan as a foreigner is really difficult. But I was pretty confident. You know, I had already worked in foreign locations like uh, Geneva and Singapore, and I had my own little success model um, of how to settle into a new place. So off I went to work, and I have to say there was no big disaster. You know, people were very nice to me. Uh, they would listen patiently to my analysis, uh, my ideas. They would say, hi, hi. Uh, Subhadrasan, hi, hi, uh, which is like, yes, yes, in Japanese. But I felt I wasn't really impacting the business yet. But I thought, never mind, you know, let's give it some time. Uh, let me at least make some progress on the personal side. So one of the, the, the great joys of living in Japan is eating Japanese food. But I am a vegetarian. <laughs> I know the vegetarians here can feel my pain. So I would go into a restaurant and I would say, I'm vegetarian. And first they would be like, a gasp. You know, I just added complexity to their life. And then, uh, you know, they would get really upset because I was a guest at the restaurant and they didn't know what to feed me. And then most of the time I would get a meal of uh, seaweed and tofu, both of which I hate. And I never understood, you know, why can't they give me something else? Why can't they give me carrots or potatoes or even like broccoli, right? So as the months went by, uh, you know, things got more frustrating. And to add to my problems at work, um, I was asked to work as a priority on a brand called Bold. So P&G uh, had launched first its uh, laundry detergent Ariel, and then many years later, we introduced a second brand of laundry detergent, uh, which was Bolt. It was a two-in-one, which was promising cleaning and softness. So in the beginning, it had been very successful, but then soon the brand hit a wall. We weren't growing anymore. Our future idea pipeline was empty. Everything would be test back, would come back really badly. Um, so all the red signs were kind of flashing on this brand. This brand really needed a big idea. And what made things worse was right in the cubicle next door, the people working on Ariel had figured out their big idea. And they were going from like strength to strength and we were like firefighting with these endless meetings. So as all this tension was building up, I was in yet another meeting, uh, endless meeting, in office when one day I had this, that day I just had this sudden realization. I thought when people said hi, hi in Japanese, they were saying, yes, I agree. I discovered very painfully during this meeting that when people say hi, hi in Japanese, they're saying, yes, I hear what you're saying. So this whole time, I thought people were agreeing with me. They were just listening very politely. So I remember this day, and I remember the meeting, and I remember the huddle room vividly because it hit me. Oh my god, I don't understand the most critical things about living here or working here. And unless I fix this, this is going to be a disaster. So I decided to go a new way. Finally, I let go of my success model from Geneva um, and started to do things differently. 
I started going for a lot of pre-meetings, which I used to skip before. Uh, I attended not only uh, the, the dinner parties, the work dinner party, but also the, the nijikai, or the after party, the second party, you know? <laughs> the truth really happens in the second party, right? I, uh, <laughs> I also did some kar uh, karaoke singing, which was a very disturbing experience for my coworkers. <laughs> uh, it's a good thing I'm not singing here today. And in my personal time, I started learning Shodo, which is Japanese calligraphy. And it was like a revelation. You know, finally, I started getting a sense of what is Japan and, and some insight into the people that I was working with like every day. And so I even discovered why Japanese restaurants could not give me carrots and potatoes on demand. So freshness is a very important promise of Japanese foods, not, not just high-end restaurants, any Japanese food. So every morning, the restaurants would shop fresh for the ingredients in their daily menu. So if they didn't have carrots on the menu, they didn't have carrots in the kitchen. So all I had to do was tell them one day in advance that I'm a vegetarian. And then there would be this most amazing feast and everybody on my table will be, I'm becoming vegetarian. You know, that looks awesome. <laughs> so here was my big discovery of 2006. I had to understand what was really important here and why, and then craft my life deliberately around it. This whole time, I had been starting from where I was but I had to start from where they were. And it turned out that's exactly what we needed to do to turn around the bowl business as well. Everything we knew about laundry came from selling Ariel. And we were using the same approach on Bold, and it wasn't working. So we declared that we don't understand this consumers enough. We had to jump in and immerse ourselves and see the world through her eyes. So we gave our consumers these disposable cameras and we said, please go take photos of everything that you enjoy in your life. They happily did it. You know, there are times consumers hate our homework exercises. There are times they love them. And uh, this was one of the times they loved. So they happily took these photos. They came back. They shared it with us. And there were all these like experiences like, uh, you know, traveling to Paris, or uh, hobbies, or um, eating fine food, or family celebrations. And, and we were looking at their life enjoyment map, and we asked them, so where does laundry fit into this? And, you know, being Japanese consumers, very politely they said, I'm so sorry, I don't enjoy laundry. <laughs> you know? In the end, I like it in the end when everything smells nice and fresh, but that's about it. And right there, we had our big idea epiphany. Bold's mission would be to bring those small enjoyments to the daily laundry experience via scents, via colors, via little surprises, little delights that we would give her. I mean, imagine she was utterly bored doing laundry and she had to do it every single day. So we would give her this laundry with moments of delight, you know, laundry with a playful spirit. So we got it now. So we went around and we decided to redesign the entire consumer experience. And we did, no stone was left unturned. Uh, we looked at every detail of product and packaging. And I'm going to show you some of the changes that we made. So this was our starting point. And first, we made the entire the logo, the colors, the packaging much more rounded, colorful, sensorial. And then on the inside, we added some little surprises, because surprises delight consumers. So the, the inner carton of the box would be a hospital white. And instead, we changed it to this delicate shade of pastel with cute little designs that would keep changing. The scoop, why does the scoop have to be white? Uh, we made it pink. The little cap that you screw onto the bottle, we added some fun elements to the cap. And in the store, 
uh, not only did we have these like sensorial like displays, uh, but even the scent testers where consumers could smell the product, they were these like pretty flower shapes and, and very cute. And remember, this is not Louis Vuitton or Chanel or, this is a mainstream brand of laundry detergent. But we were crafting every element of the consumer experience to give her that feeling of it's customized for you and it's just 298 yen, which is less than like three US dollars. So we thought, we got it, we've nailed it. So we took this revamped experience and we showed it to consumers. They liked it, but they still didn't want to buy Bolt. <laughs> it was, we couldn't figure it out. I can tell you, as a consumer researcher, this was a very hard moment for me. And in desperation, we went to one of our most loyal users and we asked her, what are we missing? We've changed the idea, we changed the packaging, we've changed the product, what are we missing? At first, she didn't answer us. And then she went and she bought some things and then she came back and she said, this is how I see Bolt. She showed us a scented candle and said, it has great scent. Then she showed us a clean, soft, white towel and said, great cleaning and softness. And then she took the candle and the towel and she wrapped it in a pair of men's underwear. I have this picture. Yeah, that black striped thing, men's underwear. She said, your product is a treasure, but it's hidden inside here. This was my first image of bold, men's underwear. And finally, it hit us. She was referring to our advertising campaign. So I have some images here. <laughs> this was what she was seeing on TV every day, sumo wrestlers and a world full of loud men, men's world, completely disconnected from the pretty cute experience that we were showing her. Actually, this advertising campaign was an award-winning, highly successful campaign, which brought the brand from nothing to where it was today. So we had always like shied away from changing it because you know, it was so successful, it was really hard to change. But at this moment, we realized we can't hold back. We can't have one foot in the past and one foot in the future. So we had to evolve our campaign to better reflect our new idea, our new packaging, and our new product. And when that happened, it was like magic. Everything just came together and everything just clicked. So I think it all comes down to this. For big ideas that delight consumers, we need to start from where they are, not from where we are. And then, in this new approach, and this part is really important, and then we need to jump in and not hold back. In my story, several things actually held us back. For example, doing things really timidly, like refusing to evolve our ad campaign, held us back. Think about it, the name of the brand is Bold, and we were scared to make those choices. Um, looking at only traditional measures of success held us back. There was a point in all our work where we were doing the typical, uh, you know, the consumer qualification and testing the traditional way. But we also introduced a new approach that better fit with these consumers that would give us a better you know, pulse on delight. The first three second reaction when she saw the proposition. You know, did she light up? Did she just like clap her hands? Did she blurt out her excitement? Because delight spills out of consumers really fast, really quickly in the first three seconds. In my personal life, uh, things held me back. Me assuming that my success model from Geneva would actually work in Japan. That held me back. And I had six terrible, terrible months and then I changed my approach and I had four spectacular and delightful years in Japan that I treasure to this day. So different things held us back and different things could be holding you back. So in closing, I would like to leave you with this thought. When it comes 
to, for, to big ideas that delight consumers start from where they are, not where you are, and then jump in and don't hold back. Be bold, be bold. It will be absolutely delightful. It was great to be here. Thank you.